Hey guys, uh, Mark here, and I knew some of you asked me to do a review about the expert set, so I'm going to do that. So before we start off, I will break it down into the different rarities. So I'm going to start off with the common expert set. Uh, the reason being I can't cover all like 100 cards at once. So the common ones are 40. And to be honest, uh, we'll go through it, but most of the good ones are the cheaper ones. Except for the Wisp, but uh, we'll get over that. Alright, so again, we're not looking at the basic set, it really is the expert. So I'm expecting most of you to have access to these common expert sets. So we'll be able to see what we can start from the deck building part. And we'll also see which card are better generally speaking and which card are better in specific decks. So if we start with the Wisp. So the Wisp is uh, one of the weaker cards in the game altogether. Now I'm not dissing it because it's a 1-1. I'm dissing it because it's actually a card that you're wasting in your hand to play it. So the fact is that cool you can play this turn one and you'll get a 1-1 one, one. but the reality is that it gets beat by absolutely everything else in the game and you are down one card so that card advantage is purely lost with the wisp there is one exception to this is in a miracle rogue with edwin um, it can be okay but even at that you if you look at any um, deck list out there it's really in like zero percent of the deck so unfortunately it really doesn't cut it not recommended at all so if we go to the one costs we have abusive sergeant so abusive sergeant is interesting for two reasons uh, first of all of course it's a two one for one so that's always a good ratio in terms of uh, attack for cost but also you have that surprise element of being able to boost something to more. So usually speaking we'll be able to minimally um, kill something with 3 defense. So that's pretty good. Um, and also keep in mind that if you have something like a wind fury or something that has charge it has that much more impact on the board because it's a surprise element overall and in itself you'll have to get rid of him later on so it's pretty good so if you're considering something like a what do I say rockbiter weapon rockbiter weapon which gives plus 3 for one mana so that's pretty good right the issue is that once you use it, it's gone forever. This guy, you still use it. Yeah, it's two, but you also have a body on the board to attack with later on or that someone will have to trade with. So overall, a pretty decent card. Argent Squire. So I've been looking at a few um, deck lists and uh, reviews online. And I mean, I play with the Argent Squire a lot. Um, a lot of people recommend to craft this. I personally, I would not recommend to craft anything under epics simply because you'll come across them eventually. Give it time and you'll eventually unpack some. Uh, and plus, I mean, you're wasting eight times more dust crafting it. Then later on, for sure, you'll get some extras and you'll di disenchant them and you'll have wasted um, 35 dust every time you craft one. So I, I really don't recommend crafting. However, if you are inclined to craft a common card, this would be one of the best ones to craft simply because uh, it's an automatic to hit to kill. So keep in mind, anything you do on this card, like on its own, it's pretty annoying because nobody will want to waste a creature to attack it. So anything you attack it with will be kind of wasteful. Let's say you have a 2-3 and you're going to hit this 1-1 one, one Divine Shield. You've already wasted 2 damage that you could have went for face on a 1-1. One, one. Like, and you didn't even kill it yet, you just destroyed the Divine Shield. So it's pretty annoying to get rid of um, and it's just it's so underhanded 
nobody wants to actually get rid of it but in itself you can use it with let's say an abusive sergeant and suddenly it becomes a 3-1 divine shield and you can take out a 3-3 with it and it'll still live uh, or if you boost it permanently with say a blessing of might or with um, some druid spells to boost permanently those are the marks like marks of the wild marks of uh, nature those are pretty good also so a very very good valid target very flexible in a lot of decks um yeah overall a pretty good card for one mana leopard gnome so leopard gnome i i would have to say it's an auto include in almost any rush deck so if you're doing a rush uh paladin a rush warlock a rush rogue um, even a rush shaman sometimes those are really what you're looking for and also rush mage sometimes I do see those um, just because the fact it's a bottled two damage so you have a guaranteed two damage and if you consider that with most uh, class spells two damage usually comes at the cost of one mana so if you consider Arcane Shot or uh, Smite, those are all spells that cost one in the first place. So you already have this with the Leopard Gnome, plus you have a 2-1, which is pretty annoying. It gets rid of those 3-2 threats for those turn 2, 3-2 threats. So another one pretty high on my list, um, as in flexibility. So all these three are pretty flexible. Um, of course, these two are more in aggro decks. I'm not saying that they're not good in other decks, they just shine better on aggro deck, but they're all three are pretty good if you don't have that one slot covered in your deck. So yeah, pretty interesting. Shield bear. So this guy seems pretty cool. I mean four toughness for one mana, that's one of the best ratios in the game. Um, it's very very good in terms of health and of eating uh, damage the only real problem is that it does nothing absolutely nothing then slow down and we have the same syndrome as the wisp here is that he doesn't do anything on his own so you would actually need to be able to boost them boost them with an abusive sergeant boost boost them with the blessing of might uh, then he might be interesting but on his home Unfortunately, he doesn't cut it. Uh, he really doesn't do enough. He just stalls the game. Unless that's what you want to do. But at the end of the day, in an aggro deck, you don't want to stall the game. You want to rush as much as possible. And in a um, large, let's say, mid-range or heavy druid deck, you don't want to draw this later. Keep build, like Try to imagine yourself being later in the game you have no cards in your hand, you're, you're trying to you know, survive and you're trying to get something like you, you'd hope for a charge or you'd hope for something to save you and you draw this. It's such a dead draw, you might as well concede when you draw him later in the game. Like in the beginning he'll stall, but is he helping you or is he really just stalling and giving the advantage on the other end? Because anything that like hits him will survive that's also the problem like he takes hits but he doesn't hit back ever so i personally don't like him much unless you give him permanently attack and then it's still a two for one like you wasted two cards to get so let's say you do blessing of might and this is the best scenario blessing of might where you would get a three four taunt for two yes but with two cards as well so you're burning two cards you're hoping that he won't be able to kill it with a single card because then you really did waste two card for one. Um, South Sea Deckhand, so I mean it's a 2-1 for one, at that, that it's not that bad. Um, it has charge when you have a weapon equipped. So all I can say about this is I don't personally use it. Um, I know it has its room in um, a rogue I would say probably the best maybe in a warrior uh, with heavy weapons or um, 
I know a friend of mine uses it with Sword of Justice in a really aggro pally deck, which is pretty cool. I mean, if you have Sword of Justice out, this guy comes out, he's a 3-2 haste, a 3-2 charge for one, which is really, really good. But other than that, in terms of flexibility, he really isn't that flexible. And in most decks, so with five of the main classes, he really is just a 2-1 vanilla. So might as well go with something else. But in the... and even at that, like in... Not in all classes with weapon does he shine. It's really, I think, the rogue that has rapid access to weapons that can use him the best. So, next up, Worgen Infiltrator. So, I do like him. I do like him for the same reason I like... Um, well, first of all, he is the cheapest stealth minion. And second of all, he kind of has that abusive sergeant uh, feel to him because he is a sleeping threat so he stays there you can play him turn one and he will actually postpone the game but in a good way unlike shield bearer shield bearer just passively postpone the game he might postpone the game against these three two cards that we'll look at a little bit later but these are really the annoying ones like those three twos those two twos are problematic and you have a little bit those are really the aggro cards and what's interesting is that he stops that because he stays there and the opponent will have to think well if I play my 3-2 right now it'll just get killed by this assassin guy so that's the pro the con of course is that it's extremely weak to AoE um, Pyromancer, Arcane Explosion, even Knife Juggler can easily take him out. And um, yeah, any every class has a some sort of AoE, so he is extremely vulnerable because he dies at absolutely everything. But I still think that he has his purpose. Um, the fact that you can boost him and let him stealth. So don't forget stealth, you are able to target your minion, opponent can't. So you could boost his attack and let him grow and wait until it's a kill shot or you need to kill something. So he is pretty versatile, but still he's the smallest stealth and the weakest in toughness stealth. So has some pros, some cons overall. I would see him in some aggro decks mostly. Yeah, so once again, probably Pally Aggro, Rogue Aggro, and uh, perhaps even Warlock Aggro. Uh, Young Dragon Hawk. So this card seems pretty cool, right? So it's a, it has Wind Fury, and usually Wind Fury are on those big flashy cards. And this guy only costs one, so you must think, wow, imagine of all the combos you can make. Imagine you play your Young Dragon Hawk, and then you abusive sergeant it and you're able to give six damage for two mana that's awesome or if you're able to boost it with a mark of the wild or you're able to boost it with uh, any of those pumping spells but the reality is as nice as those uh, magical candy mountain scenarios are they just don't happen um, the reality is it's pretty much a 1-1 with taunt and it will systematically get killed unless there's a bigger threat on the board because it's a 1-1 enemies know that there's crazy shenanigans with it and it will get killed I basically cannot recommend this card for any deck unfortunately maybe the mid-range hunter can use it and mid-range hunter I'll, I'll have a talk to that maybe in another video but it really is a beast heavy deck the reason is if you can put other beasts with it that benefit from beasts coming into play or beasts dying then it can seem like a smaller threat um, so if you have a hyena and this in the play maybe the opponent will be forced to kill your hyena first and then it'll have a chance your dragonhawk will have a chance to survive or if you've already had your buzzard in play and then you play the Wind Fury, uh, the Dragonhawk, 
at least you get a draw out of it. But on its own, it's very much suffers the Wisp syndrome that it's a one one for one and pretty much has taunt on it. So yeah, um, that's off to two costs. So two costs, Amani Berserker, pretty cool card. I really like the balance on it. It's a two three for two. So that overall is, I mean, it's it's like a crocodile but better because it strongly benefits from a classes that are able to ping. So of course the mage benefits greatly and the warrior also benefits immensely from whirlwind and his uh, angrying pings that add plus two damage. So this guy can be pretty scary if you're able to pair him in a nice uh, mage or warrior deck. Otherwise he's a little bit harder to get enraged. I'm not saying he's bad at it. It's just that he'll very likely get killed in most other cases but if you are hesitating on a two cost um, I would definitely go with something like this to pick up. Bloodsail Raider so very very good weapon orientated deck card so any decks that can benefit from a weapon make this card so much more better than its cost simply because 2-3 is what you'd expect from a 2 cost like it's 2 attack 2, two costs crystal so that's standard but it gives you a third defense which is pretty good where this really shines though is in a warrior if you have the axe out it's already a 5-3 for 2 which is totally off the scales in terms of power off the get-go if you're able to give it charge then it's a whole other story it's it's really really good um, so any deck that has weapons or I would say more than two weapons of a kind in it in your deck you can go ahead and feel safe in putting blood sail reader because if you have that weapon out it way 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 out weighs its cost um, if you don't have a weapon out, one thing that's interesting is don't be afraid to play it early. It's still a very good chump blunk blocker and very good, um, can take at least two attacks usually before dying, or it will take out a 3 2 on its own, which is still nothing bad, right? It, it still absorbs three damage for you. So overall, uh, don't be afraid to use it on a turn two, even if you don't have a weapon, but where it really shines is if you pick it up later on in the game, where you have a weapon equipped, then it's really something scary. Direwolf Alpha, um, awesome, awesome card in uh, aggro decks. I really like it with Paladins and Chamis early on. Uh, definitely try it out if you have a chance because it really helps you work with your placement. I, I really find this as a knowledge building card where you will have to work with your placement. Um, how to place thing. Whenever you have a charge you want to attack first then play your charge beside it. Um, it, it, I really like this type of card. It really makes you think and it makes you appreciate the qualities of um, Hearthstone overall because of that placement. And it keeps on giving you threat. So most of the time, it is 4 power for 2 mana, which is very, very good. And it can even be more than 4 power, like I said, with charges and things like that in a single turn. So pretty good and of course it's a beast so if you're playing in a mid-range mid hunter a uh, very good card to include but otherwise very very good in aggro decks so multiple small minions uh, not so good in bigger decks or in spell decks of course fairy dragon so fairy dragon is a very nice aggro card it survives so many things uh, so many early burst damage, early shocks, uh, early spells, that's pretty good. So it almost guarantees you if you play it turn 2 that it will have to trade with something. Like some, the opponent will have to trade for it. So that's a very good side to it. Of course the disadvantage is you cannot benefit from your own pump spells. So if you have pump spells you want to make it bigger, it won't work. It will work if you have 
pump abilities like the Shattered Sun Cleric that'll boost it plus one plus one or if you have those Dark Iron Dwarves, Abusive Sergeants, they can boost it temporarily um, but otherwise it won't get affected by uh, targeting spells. So it really is a one of uh, in terms of can't be targeted by spell powers. There's no other card right now that has that built into actually cards. There's a dragon that you can, uh, not a dragon, but a, a nymph I think you can get with uh, one of those legendary dragons, but that's not a real card. So this is really the only real card that has that ability. Uh, it's pretty cool. I like the fact that it's a 3 2 for 2, so it does pass the cost to power test. It's very good on that respect. And it will, like I said, guarantee you that a creature will have to die to fight this early on. So, very good. Iron Beak Owl, take notice it is a beast. So, that's very good in a hunter deck. And it's one of the two common silences and one of the two silences that are available at the neutral. So, other than the druid and priest. This is your only other way to get a silence. So that's pretty good. Um, silence can be powerful and it can also not be. That's why I don't really like silence on the priest because it's a card in itself and you waste that card. So it's not killing the opponent's creature, it's just silencing it and you end up losing a card to silence one of his creatures. Whereas with the Owl, you silence it and you still have a 2-1 to fight for you. So it's not the best body 2-1. Um, upside is in a Hunter deck it is a beast, but I personally like it very much simply because having a cheap silence out there can really screw up um, a lot of uh, plants like opponent puts up taunts opponent boosts his creatures opponents tries to abuse uh, auctioneer you'll be able to shut that down with silence and it's fun to have a readily available silence at a low cost um, there are higher costed silence we'll look at it later but as a low cost silence it's pretty good so loot hoarder I mean it's okay, it's a 2 1 4 2 um, death rattle draw card. So the problem is that it replaces itself but only when it dies and only if it hasn't been silenced. So that's kind of a little problem. So, first of all, you paid 2 to get a creature that will very likely die and also the other problem is that it dies to most hero ability powers so you're paying two to get another ability hero ability power that costs two so you're coming out pretty much even and in the case of a mage he did absolutely nothing for you because the mage will simply kill it without taking damage of course against a rogue or a druid Druid will take one, Rogue will take two, but he still has one hit with the weapon. I mean, overall, I don't like it very much later on when you get to get um, advanced cards, but early on you can try to play with it. Um, mostly in aggro decks, because I would say aggro decks are the ones that run out of fuel. So especially if you're trying to play a Paladin, that runs out of fuel. Um, if you're trying to play um, Rogue, that can run out of fuel. The Warlock has its own fuel with lives, so you can kind of refill your hand slowly. But in an aggro deck, so if you're trying, if you want to try out your first aggro deck, you can definitely put him in. Otherwise, I wouldn't really recommend it. Mad Bomber. So I'm not going to talk about arena builds in this video. But in Arena, I love him. Um, otherwise, he's just too chaotic to um, make any benefit out of him. And basically, if you ever do put him in your deck, just try to play him when you have nothing on your board. An opponent has at least one creature on, her bo on his board. That's the only 
place where I can say you have a calculated risk because otherwise if you have things on your board as well then you're taking a real risk um, of possibly hitting yourself in the foot and I've done this a few times and you really don't want to be at the receiving end of killing one of your three toughness creatures it's absolutely infuriating um, so I wouldn't recommend him at all to be honest just because uh, he's too chaotic maybe in a self hurt uh, warrior deck where you benefit from your creatures getting hurt in a warrior deck maybe otherwise unfortunately I wouldn't really recommend them. Brewmaster so you want to use him in possibly a battle cry uh, scenario where you have a few creatures that have battle cry I've also seen him sometimes to reheal up large toughness creatures like uh, healing a turtle or healing up a fen creeper and lastly you could use him as a double charge so you play your charge you attack with them then you play your youthful brewmaster you bring back the charge in your hand and if you're able to play the charge a second time the charge can hit again so that's pretty cool but again those are very niche scenarios because chances are if you play him early you won't have the mana to do the multiple cards at once and if you play him late in the game chances are you won't have those extra charge lying around you'll have used them earlier in the game so he's he's not bad like I like his flexibility and worst case scenario you can play him turn two and not bounce anything at all so he's still the three two um, for two so still the good, very good ratio I would rather have him than Mad Bomber to be honest at this point so and in which deck a deck where you have charge and battle cries that's pretty much it so three so this is where it gets interesting this is where we have some neat needy cards uh, Acolyte of Pain so very good in mage because you can hurt yourself to draw cards so it's almost a pool of three cards with a mage and opponents will simply hate this guy if you play it with the mage um, in other classes he of course shines a lot less because you can't guarantee damage on him um, maybe the warrior warrior can also effectively hurt your own creature so warrior and mage can make a good deal out of him otherwise he's like a expensive loot hoarder and with less damage potential so I would only recommend him in a mage deck and in a pain warrior where you you hurt your own creatures and you don't mind hurting everything then he's pretty good earth and ring farseer so a lot of people have been saying that this is a very good card I I can't disagree with it it's a 3-3-3 so it has a nice balance to it 3-3-4-3 three, three, three. and you'll realize later uh, when you start playing a bit more that it is a little bit better than it looks especially in uh, rogue and warlock and maybe priest because it will fight very well against aggro decks uh, I would say that's mostly where it shines where an opponent is trying to burn you down very quickly this guy will first of all heal you up a bit and have a 3-3 body so a chunky body being able to take out some 2-3s and surviving or 2-1s and surviving so it really is anti-aggro the same way I said that all aggro decks should have this this kind of is a natural uh, counter to it so it heals you up and it has a body to fight afterwards so if you're finding that you're getting killed really quickly with your deck you might want to try to add two of these guys in and if you're struggling against aggro he might help you out a bit to stall um, now why does he shine in warlock is that he can allow you to draw one and a half cards with your warlock hero ability 
So that's pretty cool. So you are guaranteed that you are using Warlock Lives as a resource. And this simply gives you a little bit more resource. So that's why it's nice. In a rogue, um, in a rogue is that usually rogues will kind of tend to ignore the board and try to go for face, face, face. And of course, if you're playing against another aggro, then you're getting hit in the face a lot. And if you're stabbing with your pointy stick, then chances are you're also getting hit in the face with it. So this helps you a little bit cope with that amount of face damage. Um, and with the priest, I'll look at it later on because I, I really like the priest right now. But um, with the shadow priest um, card, you are able to deal three damage with this. So it turns the card that turns your healing into damage. This becomes a huge threat. So it deals three damage when it comes into play, and you have a three three for three. So then that's a very very good ratio, like crazy good ratio overall if you're able to turn healing into damage. So that's why in that specific niche of where you turn damage, uh, healing into damage, he's pretty good also. Flesh eating cool benefits from a lot of things dying. So um, AOE damage, um, warriors that hurt themselves, um, card that deal damage to everything pretty good. Of course the issue is that it's under strength for its price. So the only event where I would see breaking even is that you already have cards into play and they're ready to attack and then you play him and you kill off the creatures then it starts to grow right away. So that's where it's useful. Um, but once again, its main use is in an aggro, of course, because you can at least guarantee on your end, you know you have a lot of creatures, so even if the opponent doesn't, you, you know it's guaranteed to grow from your creatures dying. Um, I wouldn't recommend him in any spell-heavy decks. Um, or, like I said, the other one that can benefit is a lot of AoE, so possibly a warrior with whirlwinds and shield slam and things like that that's able to... And uh, dish out a lot of damage and kill a lot of creatures at once. Maybe he can benefit from it, but a little bit on the weak side. So, here's the shining star of the hour, the Harvest Goal. So, it might seem kind of dull, right? So, it's very similar to the goal in terms of power, 2-3. So, you would think, wow, that kind of sucks. But again, it has the same syndrome as the Argent Squire, is that it's very underhanded. So you have a 2-3, two, 2 damage you might think, well, that's not really threatening, it would take me 15 hits to kill me with this. True. So that, that's not where it shines. Where it shines is that it's a very annoying creature. And most of the time, in terms of card ratio, you will have to waste two cards to kill this one card. And keep in mind, this is two cards in one, right? So it's a 2-3 and a 2-1 one once it dies. So most of the time, the opponent will have to waste two cards to kill your one golem. And even at that, if he actually wasted two good cards to kill it, then you're just a winner because you only spent three mana for this guy and opponent probably spent more than three to kill off these two golems so that's very good for that respect and it it loves um, warrior decks where you can kill your own creature so with a brawl at least if you know you brawl you kill everything on the board he'll stay alive or a warlock that wipes the whole board he'll stay alive so any aggro deck um, Warrior deck, it's pretty good. Anything that can pump it up or give it taunt is also very annoying because then it'll be like opponent will be forced to ram into it, and once it dies, it comes back as a 2 1. So, one of my favorite uh, three cost cards, very versatile in a lot of different decks, and very, very annoying to kill off. So, that's a cool sight. Um, Jungle Panther. Very, very, very nice card uh, for a hunter. 
because it's a beast. It has stealth. It survived to small AoE. So anything that does one damage, it survives. That's very good. And the very shining point here is that it comes built in with four damage. It is the highest damage for three mana. And what I really like is that it is almost guaranteed to deal that four damage. I kind of consider it like a slow charge <laughs> because um, charge you can guarantee that damage as well, right? So it's something that would have charge, you can guarantee it will go hit phase for that. But this is a guarantee next turn that it'll be able to hit for four. Um, but yeah, this guy really, really shines in a Hunter deck. Otherwise, it's still pretty good. So if you have problem dealing with four toughness creatures, or if you have some um, taunt that you have a problem with dealing with, this has a very high damage ratio to cost. I would almost consider it like a four damage spell for three and in the worst case let's say it attacks for face the enemy still has to kill it so you will have guaranteed four damage to the face and he will still have to waste something to kill it so I mean it overall it's I find it better than a four four damage spell for three because it also leaves a body on the ground um, raging worgen uh, has great benefits of being a possible Wind Fury. So has some very nice shenanigans where opponent would have a 1-1 one, one in play and you would attack it, kill it, and then you get your Wind Fury and you're able to hit again with it. So that's pretty cool. But the reality is most of the time it doesn't get to that point. So it will very, very often get killed. You see, unlike Farseer, people don't really want to kill it because it's a 3-3, you know, and it already did its job of healing. This guy is a lot more threatening. Um, I could almost say it almost has taunt because people will want to throw themselves at it and try to kill it as soon as possible. Uh, but the reality is if you have it in a warrior deck, it's very nice. If you're able to give it charge in a warrior deck, which warrior has two ways of doing it, it's very nice. Um, and if it does survive for a turn, usually you'll be able to dish out a lot of damage with it. Problem is, usually it doesn't. So, I would recommend him in a warrior deck. Ah, Scarlet Crusader. Another heavy hitter of the three mana. So, this guy has the same power, um, power as in. Uh, good attributes as the Argent Squire, the fact that it is um, Divine Shield and most of the time opponent will have to waste two things to hurt it or vice versa it will be able to kill something with three toughness and survive so opponent will still have a two for one in the sense that you will have killed a creature and opponent will still have to get rid of it so that's why like all these cards that I've been recommending, the Argent Squire, the Harvest Golem, um, and the Scarlet Crusader are two for ones. Opponent will usually waste two cards on it, and that's why Wisp is bad. It's because it's usually a zero for one. So opponent lives, and you lost a card. And same thing with Shield Bearer, opponent will usually live and you lose a card. <coughs> so yeah, sorry about that. Um, so overall, if we keep on going, Scarlet Crusader, pretty good card. Uh, you're able to boost it or even in itself a 3-1 is pretty good uh, even against a mage he'll have to waste two ability powers to kill it and it'll still have a chance to deal three damage so he's wasting four mana and two turns of his ability and you still are able to kick him in the face for three so one of the recommended cards Tauren Warrior looks nice on paper has taunt um, 
two three and rage plus three so you have a possibility of having like a five two the reality is though is that it will never live to be that size most of the time what will happen is opponent will hit it with a creature and finish it off with a spell or will hit it with his ability hero ability and finish it off with a creature so if you have a choice to be honest go with raging organ simply because he has a guaranteed three attack and um he has the, all those nice built-in wind fury and plus one attack but he almost has taunt like i said so players will go out of the way to hit it and when they do hit it it will hit them back in the face for at least three possibly four uh whereas with this most of the times they will play smart and they will only get hit for two and then the enrage will kill off a creature or something so unfortunately a nice card on paper but in reality when you play a lot with it you realize it's kind of underwhelming talmar farseer um again wind fury looks nice on paper has it built in you're like wow you'll be able to hit but it suffers the same problem as everything with wind fury is that people hate it and will kill it as soon as it hits the ground and the fact is it has a low power threshold so if you're looking at it it has two so a 3-3 three, three, a little scarlet crusader boom kills it and it lives like your scarlet crusader would live and the opponent's trial marcy farseer would have died so once again it gets out one by raging morgan which is still able to have its 3-3 three, three power and has the possibility of being a 4-2 wind fury so if you have a choice i would most often go for the worgen if you're looking to put a torn warrior or a thralmar force here go for the waging worgen instead four mana um ancient brewmaster so a five four for a four plays a pretty decent role now the real issue with it is that when it comes in later so later as a turn four you have a few problems on your hand either you don't really want to bounce what you have left in your game or you won't have anything at all to bounce which is just a vanilla five four which is not necessarily bad but there are better four costed cards out there and in your deck and specific class specific cards that cost four you don't really want to be just throwing out a five four out there turn four and just letting it get killed by a, a four two or a four four and kind of not having anything done out of it and it's pretty expensive if you're looking for a bouncer I would strongly recommend just going for the youthful brewmaster because it has a lot more versatility. Like I said, if you're looking for something that has charge, can attack, um, so you play your charge, it attacks, then you bounce it back to your hand, then you play it again. You want a low costed bouncer, but this is a high-ish costed bouncer, so you won't be able to get your full effect out of it. Or even as if you wanted something as simple as um, playing the abusive sergeant, boost a creature, bounce the abusive sergeant back into your hand, play abusive sergeant a second time so you get plus four attack, that's feasible because we're talking of four mana. Whereas this guy costs four mana and he's a 5-4 so he won't have that immediate surprise impact because he's too expensive he's a nice guy but too expensive unfortunately cult master um, anything that makes you draw cards is usually very good the problem is with him though that he rarely lives to see the cards drawn so unless you have an aggro deck so many small costed creatures he will never do his job right and furthermore if he dies so let's say you have ton of little one ones into play and this guy and the opponent has consecration so deals two damage to all of you 
you won't even get the benefit of drawing. The only scenario where I do see him useful and where I've played with him a few times is if you have multiple, so let's say you have three 1-1s one from your Preladin ability power and you play him, you want to physically throw your three 1-1s one at creatures so you will see the most benefit because you know this guy will not live to see another day. They will throw anything at him and unfortunately most of the time these little two ones will do the job of killing him. So it's unfortunate. It's a pretty cool card but it never lives to see its ability happen. Most of the time unfortunately it's a very high costed, well high costed, four cost creature but with two toughness it just dies too easily and it did nothing for you. And we'll, we'll compare it to other stuff, but the problem is, if you don't have other creatures, it just is a 4-2 that does nothing for you. Which really sucks. It doesn't even give you a card when it dies. So it's very hard to play around on your end, and opponent can easily make you regret putting this in your deck. So unfortunately I can't recommend it. Dark Iron Dwarf. Uh, Dark Iron Dwarf has the same benefits, of course, of the Abusive Sergeant. But I slightly prefer the Abusive Sergeant more, simply because it's a lot cheaper to get like that 4 power right away. So you get 2 on the Abusive Sergeant and plus 2 on something else. Whereas here it's 6, but for 4 mana. Like the ratio is on the Abusive Sergeant 4 power for 1 mana, or 6 power for 4 mana. Like the ratio is much much more interesting. It's like 400% on the abusive sergeant, and it's like 150% on the dark iron dwarf. But of course, it leaves you with a 4-4 body. The only thing I can find interesting with this is that it's a nice 4 power, so it will screw around with priests that can't really kill it. Um, but otherwise, it's it's an okay card. It's an okay card. Um, I really like him in arena though but for a constructed deck, it's just okay. If you have nothing else, um, he's okay. But once again, he does do something when it comes into play. Unlike Ancient Brewmaster, that if you didn't have uh, anything you wanted to bounce in your hand, it could, it could actually be detrimental to you. This guy will always be either good or neutral. Like if you don't have any other creatures, it's a 4-4-4-4 which is meh, it's standard. Uh, if you do have another creature, then you're boosting it and it's good. So you're adding an extra two damage to your gameplay value. But the problem is with this guy, if you do not want to bounce something in your hand, you're still obligated to, which can actually be bad. And if you do want to bounce something, you'll probably won't have enough mana to play it again. So that's why I'm saying four mana bounce, too expensive. Anyways, so an okay card. Dread Corsair. Dread Corsair, um, I mean, it's a three, it's a taunt. There's not a million taunts out there, and I did say that when starting out to play uh, Hearthstone, using taunts are pretty good, and it gets you to understand what they're good against, and I I really hate aggro decks, to be honest. Um, you might notice that I have an anti-aggro deck. That's what I really play a lot of in Ranked. And the reason is, a lot of people play aggro, and Taunt will help you counter that. But um, this guy, he is unfortunately very bad in all decks except with a um, weapon. So, and a reliable weapon. So we're talking of a warrior weapon is mostly where he will shine. Sometimes a rogue weapon will be able to make it shine, but this guy is really good in a warrior from what I've seen uh, from experience. So with the axe, um, the bigger axe, the 5 damage axe, he's totally free. With the smaller axe, he only costs 1. 1 for a 3-3 three, three. taunt is awesome. Uh, even with the weaponsmith, he'll be able to bring it out easier. So overall, very good in a weapon-orientated deck, very poor uh, in every other deck, simply because if you want to have a 3-3 taunt and you don't have weapon, just go for the 
freaking iron fur uh, bear. The iron fur bear is 3 3 taunt for 3. So, the only upside weapons. Mugishan Warden. So, this guy, fun at the beginning when you get him. Uh, he will slow down the game a lot. Uh, should be able to slow down the game much better than the shield bearer. But he suffers from having one attack. So unless, and he, he has pretty much the same problem as the as the um, shield bear is that unless you're able to boost his attack naturally and permanently he will suck because he will take two to three hits for you but will only be able to give two to three damage back for four mana so I mean, once again, if you're finding yourself that you're dying way too quickly to aggro decks, he is a pretty big door stopper. He will stop lots of stuff, and if you pair him with something like the Dire Wolf, he starts getting interesting. So he will have two power, or if you're able to give him permanently attack with class spells, um, like the druid uh, marks or the rogue um, the rogue the rogue boosts for plus two or plus four attack or even the um, paladin uh, plus three plus zero blessing of might or blessing of kings even like all these blessings and these marks work really well with it but on its own I find it a bit weak so I would rather have uh, Dustingo like and if we go back to Desdingo, uh, Desdingo, Sijin Shieldmaster is the standard four mana for a three five, and now you have four mana for a one seven. So you're th trading three attack for uh, sorry two attack for two defense. Uh, I find that a very weak trade off to be honest. I would rather have a three five than a one seven. That's why. So if you really find yourself in a tight spot with aggro decks, yeah, maybe add him, add one on top of the dust dingoes. But if you have a choice, I would go with two shield masters instead of this guy. Storm Silvermoon Guardian, so it's okay, but if you want a divine shield, go for the Scarlet Crusader first, simply because. That two toughness difference isn't that big of a deal because opponent will still have to waste either two attacks on it or two ability powers on it. Whereas here, he'll still have to waste two attacks or at least one ability power and an attack. But all of that for one extra mana. One mana for two toughness is not always the best ratio. Um, if you have a choice, I would go for the um, Scarlet Crusader. Simply put, he has some uses in the arena again, but overall, he really doesn't have any much use unless you really have a deck built around Divine Shield, like in a Paladin, Divine Shield, and Divine Shield Eating deck. Maybe, but otherwise just go for the Scarlet Crusader. Spellbreaker. So the larger of the two um, silences as a neutral card. So the thing is, of course, it's not a beast, as you might notice. And <clears throat> it is uh, fairly priced. So 4 for 4, for power, for 4 cost. Uh, it silences a minion, so it will never be wasted in the sense that as long as there's an enemy minion that has an ability, it will have had its use once it comes into play. Uh, it's resilient against priest deck. With that 4 power, priests have a problem dealing with 4 power. It has 3 defense, so it will even survive those little annoying 2 power cards. A lot of 2 power cards, it survives 2 damage spells, so it has a lot of uses. Um, I do like him. If I have a choice though, in an aggro deck, I would go with the Owl. 
In other regular mid-range decks, so if you, you find yourself having a very nice balance of cards from 1 to 6 costs, so a few 1 cost, a few 2 cost, a few 3 cost, a few 4 cost, etc. Um, I would probably put him over the, um, the Iron Beak Owl, simply because you have some really nice 2 cost creatures that you can already put in your deck, and... If you find yourself lacking 4 cost creatures, I would rather play him than most of the other cards. Like, I just find him more usable in more decks than the Corsair. Like, Corsair is for weapons. Cult Master is niche where you have a lot of little 1-1s. One uh, Mugushan is where you would have boosts. Uh, Brewmaster is very, very specific to having uh, battle cries and charges. So he just has a lot more uses so if you find yourself lacking four cost cards in a average um, mana ramp then I would consider adding him five cost so five cost unfortunately is kind of weak in the uh, expert set but fan creeper so fan creeper it's okay it's a three six suffers from the same problem as the Mogushan warrior in the sense that it gets overshadowed by Das Dingo. Uh, because Das Dingo, basically, the difference between this and Das Dingo is that you are spending one more mana for one more toughness. In most cases, that's a very bad trade off. So you're much better off playing with Das Dingo. Um, Silverhand Knight and the Silverhand Squire. So you play him, he comes with a 2 2. Sounds like a fair deal. You get 6 power for 5, which is okay. Only problem is that that 2-2 two -two will often get killed off by an AoE spells because the problem is he comes in much later in the game, so he comes out turn 5. By that time, opponent is usually in possession of an AoE spell in his hand. And that just means that most of the time, this guy will be a 4-4 for 5. That's his big weakness, is that opponent will play a Consecration, a Holy Nova, and you will be left with a 4-2 for 5 mana. And he, ha he will have killed off your 2-2 square. I'm not saying that it's per se a bad card. It's just that it costs a little bit too much to be in an aggro deck, and in most cases it's very vulnerable to AoE. Spiteful Smith. Um, very underrated card in Rogues, and you, if you want to try it, this out in a Rogue, it's pretty cool. It's simply that you are able to turn your ability weapon, so your class ability weapon of the Rogue, into a 3 damage poker <laughs> for two mana which is really crazy that ratio on your weapon becomes very very interesting once the spiteful, spiteful smith is out um, otherwise though very unreliable card when it comes to other classes or other weapons simply because if you consider the fact that it um, it's the only reliable weapon you have is with the rogue with the warrior he might be good, he might be helping out your axes, but in the meantime, he's an expensive yeti with one more toughness. So, once again, in most decks, you will simply be better off with the yeti rather than having the smith. Because you're spending one mana for one extra toughness, which is a very bad deal. Um, in a rogue, though, that one mana for one toughness might be worth it. And the rogue, the fun thing is... He has ways of activating the Enrage on it. So you could actually use your Shiv to Shiv your own Spiteful Smith. So you draw a card with your Shiv, plus you just activated your weapon so that now your weapons are poisoned, if you will. They, they have plus two attacks. So that's pretty cool. Uh, niche uses in Warrior, with if you have a heavy weapon Warrior. Otherwise not really with it with Paladin, uh, with Sha Shaman more or less, also has a few weapons and uh, yeah that's pretty much it. Strangle Thorn Tiger. 
pretty nice card. I like the fact that it survives to almost everything in its stealth mode. So it will survive to the most brutal spells like uh, Flame Strike. So you almost have a guaranteed 5 damage for a 5 and a 5 toughness. Which means that most of the time um, a lot of people put value to 3 powered creatures and 4 powered creatures. Which means that you will have, he will have to attack it twice or will have to attack it plus an ability power to take it out. So as it stands it's one of the best mid-range hunter cards. It stands very strong against aggro decks. Um, it's it's overall not too bad. Uh, as a stealth it's pretty good and as a beast stealth it's even better. And I really like the fact that it survives everything. Um, everything that can be thrown at it while it's in stealth mode. So, pretty cool card. Venture Coleman Mercenary. So, I have a big problem with this card simply because it's, well, it's super cheap. So, 5 cost for 7. You're gonna say, wow, you're crazy not to play this. The problem is that all your other minions cost 3 more. So it's destroying your temple, and the worst thing that you can see is this guy getting frozen over. So what happens often is that the opponent will freeze him, so you will have a 7-6 that you can't use, and you can't play anything of value. So the problem is that two mana that you say one or two mana that you saved on his body will be lost at the cost of your next creatures you're gonna play mind you he is very good in arena but he is terrible bad in most decks um, maybe in a very spell heavy deck like a mage which has like spells galore he is good but as soon as you have more than, let's say, 15 creatures in your deck, you do not want to play with him. Simply because he has a big risk of getting frozen or getting stalling your game. Um, and otherwise, yeah, so overall I would rather have the Ogre, Boulder Fist Ogre 6-7 six, for 6, than this 7-6 for 5 which will slow down and screw you over if you don't have uh, any ways of unfreezing him or any ways of silencing him. So, lastly, yeah, lastly is the six costed. Uh, Frost Elemental, hello, speaking of freezing something, um, you'll be able to freeze a character, um, you'll be able to have a 5 power 5 toughness so my gripe with this card is that the strangled thorn tiger does a better job and for freezing there are better ways to stall the game so if you're looking to I mean at point you don't want to stall the game you want to kill a creature or you want to harm a creature when it comes into play, or you want to boost one of your own creature, or you want to silence like something that's permanent. So if you you play him, he will permanently silence something. This is just slowing down for one turn, and the problem is it still is a five-five, and you're not dealing with the threats. So overall, I would rather have a strangle thorn tiger than this guy that slows down the game by one turn for one creature but doesn't deal with it and um, so unfortunately all these sixes are a bit weak but we'll, we'll go through them priestess of Elune restores four health to your hero and is a 5-4 it's bad it's pretty bad um, simply because you never want to like the same way I don't want to overpay for health um, I don't want to overpay for something that dies to almost anything like if we go back to our little guy here he has four potential power for one mana and this guy costs us six and has four toughness and he yeah he heals us for four 
but that won't like that really won't be a big deal see this is a very nice balance card three mana you get a three three and it restores three health here in theory you would need a six six that heals you for six and cost six but this is way underpowered under toughness and under health if you will for the cost um, so nope maybe Ugh, and, and I don't like saying this, but maybe in a warlock if you find yourself that you need to heal. But honestly, I would stick to just this guy for some health and some warlock spells that heal you before playing this girl. Nope. Wind Fury Harpy, uh, four or five. So it's a big Yeti that costs two more mana. Has Wind Fury. So upside is that wow it has a wind fury it has a potential of dealing eight damage per turn downside is it will always die um, so it's almost like a four or five taunt for six which is unfortunately badly costed so if we look at this dingo three five four four which is very well costed well rounded card a six four 6 mana for a 4-5 taunt, not very good. And again, the problem is, this would, wouldn't be that bad, but the problem is that turn 6 or turn 7, depending on if you played first or second, um, opponent will always have an answer for it, or will have board control, or will have board play with it. So, And there's no consistent way of giving it charge maybe a hunt, um, a warrior that can give it charge could use it but then you're better off using a smaller charging card like a uh, raging morgan that you can systematically give it charge and you abuse its wind fury potential this unfortunately like all these six costed aren't very good so quick recap wisp terabad out of the one costed the most flexible out of all of them is the Argent Squire, so fits in most decks, very adaptable to boosting, and will generally be annoying. Our Abusive Sergeant Leopard Gnome are very good in aggro decks, still mildly good in other decks, but they usually shine in aggro decks. Shield Bearer is okay, and not bad, but okay in a deck where you can boost its power permanently. Uh, South Sea Deckhand, pretty much Rogue, and Worgen Infiltrator if you want to have that threat to be able to kill a 3-2 power. Uh, but the problem is it's a pretty much dead card if you draw it later. Very interesting card in an aggro deck though. Young Dragonhawk? Nope. Amani Berserker? Good in a Mage and in a Warrior. Blood Sail Raider? good in anything that you have a weapon and don't be afraid to play it early if you don't have a weapon because you still have a 2-3 not de a very decent body um, good in a hunter it's a beast I very much like it to be able to play around with it good with a shaman or a paladin where it's able to pop creatures on the right side of it always giving it plus one attack to those uh, totems and those uh, little one ones very interesting fairy dragon very solid, very interesting, the fact that it has um, one of the only cards that's able to be immune to spells or hero powers, so it will take a hit for you. Cheapest silence in the game for on a creature for a neutral, so very good. Loot Hoarder in aggro, Mad Bomber, nope, Youthful Brewmaster, maybe with charges. So overall in the two costed I would say Dire Wolf is Dire Wolf and Fairy Dragon are probably the most balanced in any type of deck. The other ones, as I said, are slightly nicher cards. Three costed. Um, Hurt Yourself deck and Mage. Uh, very good in Warlock. Good if you're struggling for health and against aggro. Many creature card. Almost any deck. So good in almost any deck. Good in Hunter. Decent in other to be able to kill off a 4 power cr creature, a uh, 4 toughness creature, or deal a 4 damage to the face. And good in a self hurt or mage deck. And good in almost any deck.
and not good, not good. Uh, so overall, I would recommend Harvest, Earth and Farseer, and Scarlet Crusader for most deck, and the other ones, as I said, in certain situation. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of them. So my two favorite here are probably for most decks are probably Dark Iron Dwarf and Spellbreaker. So they all, all have their uses, but probably these are the two more flexible that you could fit into uh, most decks. Ugh, if I have to choose something, probably the Strangothor Tiger. All the other ones have slightly niche uses. Um, these are subpar versions. This is kind of subpar. This is weak to AoE. This is good in a rogue, but this overall has more uses in most decks. And in this, unfortunately, I can't recommend anything. If you were to force me to recommend something, I'd go with the Frost, because it slows down the game and it has a nice rounded 5-5, five five, kind of the Stranglethorn body, but it it just, ah, and these two, this is Terabad, and this will mostly be a 4-5 taunt for 6, so you're get, you're not getting your money's worth. So that's about it. So I'll leave a link in the description with uh, the cards I recommend and the most versatile ones. And next time I will probably do a rare. Hmm. Yeah, so next time we'll look at the rare ones. Um, and that should be much shorter because there's only 36 rares. Well, as opposed to 40 comments. But uh, all right, guys. So that's it. Red Wolf out, and if you like, uh, you can just leave a like, and uh, if you have any comments about the video, just drop me a comment, and if you'd like to see anything specific, any type of deck, just leave me a comment, and I'll eventually get to making one. Red Wolf out. Thanks, guys.